welcome to Ant 200, Introduction to Archaeology. Today, we're going to be talking about scientific racism and the rise of bioarchaeology. So to start with that, I want to begin with giving a brief kind of intellectual history of the concept of scientific racism itself. The fundamental subject of bioarchaeology is the exploration of human origins and human variation. Professional writings on these topics began in the 18th century, which was also a time when the concept of race was formalized and racial classification systems were first proposed. A key figure in all this was a man named Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, a German physician and anatomist who developed a five-fold classification system of human varieties, including quote unquote, American, Asian, African, European, and Malay, a term that was popular at the time to refer to populations from the Pacific Islands. Blumenbach applied a biblical view to human diversity and argued that people spread around the world after the Great Flood. He assumed that Caucasians were the primary or quote unquote original race because they had strayed the least distance away from the Ark's reported landing point in Turkey and the Middle East. He also noted that the Caucasian skull was most symmetrical and therefore nearest, perfe nearest perfection, uh, indicating that it was the kind of type skull first created by God. Differences in phenotype, he proposed, developed in response to different environmental conditions that the people aboard Noah's Ark had encountered as they moved further and further away. He also argued that things like climate, diet, life weight, and disease had all contributed to the degeneration of non-Caucasian races. In the United States, Samuel G. Morton used Blumenbach's five racial varieties to propose an alternative theory of racial evolution. For Morton, the human skull was a highway back in time, a way to trace racial differences to their very beginnings. He started in the 1830s to acquire the necessary anatomical specimens for his study of racial difference. Specifically, Morton used his collection, connections with the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society society to buy skulls that have been dug up from archaeological sites. As smallpox and other epidemics swept across the United States, Native, Americans be, Native American bodies became a hot commodity on the skull market and were bought up by Morton. At the time of his death in 1851, Morton's cranial library contained over a thousand specimens and was considered the world's most comprehensive skull collection. Morton was really responsible for establishing the science of craniometry, which basically refers to the analysis of skull size and shape. And he published his research in a book called Crania Americana in 1839. Morton's racial theory was based on measurements of what's called cranial capacity or brain size. How Morton measured cranial capacity was to fill up each individual skull with BB-sized lead shot, to pour out the shot, and to measure the metric volume of that lead shot. Morton's work was really the first attempt to apply scientific rigor to racial science through large sample sizes and replicable measurements. According to his research, Caucasians had the largest brain, followed by people, Native Americans, followed by people from the African continent. But Morton didn't stop there. He went one step further. He went to correlate cranial size and metric cubic capacity with particular behavioral traits. Morton's colleagues around the world collected skulls for him along with specific data about the individual's age, sex, race, occupation, as well as personality traits. Morton used this data to compare their behaviors with metric attributes. 
The core assumption here was that the brain size of an individual skull was directly linked to intelligence. And these metrics provided a way of explaining why one race seemed to act differently from another. Morton asserted that his skull sample fundamentally proved that Caucasians were the superior race. Specifically, he argued that Anglo-Saxons were at the top of the pile, followed by people of Jewish ancestry and then other people from the, from the Caucasoids like Hindus. For Morton, this hierarchy was fundamentally biblical. It was part of God's divine master plan. Morton's work has since been critiqued by scholars like Stephen Gold in a book called The Mismeasure of Man. According to Gold, Morton was unconsciously biased because of his belief that some races were inferior to others and because of his belief in what was called polygenism. Polygenism refers to how observed differences between races reflect differences in the quality, in their intelligence and ability, and that these Qual these qualitative differences are based on fundamental differences in hum human varieties, meaning that human these different human races had different origins. In contrast, monogeism argued that human races came from a single origin created by God, and that differences, observed differences in these races was based on degeneration or changes over time. So monogeism is really represented by Blumenbach's views, whereas polygenism is represented by Morton's views. Both polygenism and monogeism had racist implications, since many monogenists believed that races other than Europeans had degenerated to what was considered an inferior state. The scholarly commitment to biblical frameworks began to change following the publication of The Origins of Species in 1859 by naturalist Charles Darwin. Darwin reasoned that since resources are inherently limited, the young of reproductive age struggle to survive. Most don't make it, and in the long run, the survivors who do persist persist because they have traits that give them a competitive advantage. These physical variations or competitive advantages are passed along to the next generation so that each generation, the number of individuals with advantageous traits steadily increases. The evolutionary process is gradual and continuous eventually giving rise to new species through what Darwin has called natural selection. Importantly, origins of species introduce the idea that all organisms, including humans, are descended from a common ancestor. And he set out a clear explanation for the Earth's evolving biological diversity. In constructing this theory about diversity, Darwin unwittingly provided a scientific rationale for social evolutionary theories. 19th century anthropologists argued that like other organisms, people struggle to survive and that the successful ones are the fittest. Social Darwinists ranked human societies according to their evolutionary status and argued that all human progress depends on competition. While anthropologists drew on evolutionary theory, to rank human populations, the rankings actually remain pretty similar to the earlier ideas of Morton and Blumenbach, with Caucasians at the top, followed by other racialized groups like Native Americans and people from the African continent. Lewis Henry Morgan played a critical role in developing social Darwinist ideas through a book called Ancient Societies. Before I talk about ancient societies a little bit, I'd like you all to think about what features, uh, what the kind of defining features of civilization are. This is an important question that lies at the heart of, of Morgan's work and something that we'll come back to later in the term as we talk about the rise of state civilizations. <clears throat> 
For Morgan, he developed a measure of civilization that worked backwards from the present in order to reconstruct the evolution of different human societies. He drew anatomical parallels between Neanderthal skulls first found in Germany in 1856 and the skulls of living Australian aboriginals who were believed to represent what Morgan considered an archaic or early state of human development. Basically, Morgan's idea was that Western civilization was modern and the most highly developed form of civilization, and everyone else was basically in a different state of primitiveness. Following this logic of evolution, more primitive societies represented earlier iterations that Western society had already, already went through. Based on his observations of indigenous groups in the United States, Morgan developed a theory of cultural evolution. This theory was unilineal, meaning that it moved in one direction and had three basic phases with several different subcategories within each phase. The first phase was what Morgan called savagery. This was, this was kind of categorized based on in uh, societies living in hunting and gathering um, subsistence modes and primarily using things like stone tools. In Morgan's next phase, what he called barbarism, we see the development of agriculture, larger kind of more permanent settlements, as well as different types of tools like metal tools and ceramics. This period is what archaeologists often refer to as the Neolithic Revolution. The final stage of human development, according to Morgan's research, was civilization. Civilization had all of the things that we often think about as representing complex modern societies. So things like writing, uh, centralization, large cities, uh, organized religion, etc. In addition to these kind of material and social elements, Morgan also said that throughout time, people developed different types of family and kin type structures. These structures started with promiscuity and incest groups in the states of savagery and then progressed into marriage and monogamy in civilization. These kind of ideas about social material and family-based relationships were very appealing at the time in the 19th century because they fit well with Christian notions about what was moral and uh, what was valuable in society. These kind of racial hierarchies that were established by Morton, Blumenbach, and Morgan were used to justify US policies based on discrimination and the premise that different people of different races were in fact biologically inferior. For both Morgan and Morton, Native Americans played a critical role in developing their scientific theory. Skull collecting among uh, naturalists and archeologists in the United States seeking to build up their museum collections helped contribute to these racial scientific theories in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. For instance, in 1865, Louis Agassiz, the director of the Harvard Peabody Museum depicted here, petitioned Secretary of War Edwin Stanton for Native American bodies to enlarge the museum's natural history collections. U.S. Surgeon General William Hammond complied with such requests for human remains, ordering medical officers to collect Native bodies from battlefields. As Native Americans became confined to reservations or suffered losses due to military conquest, the remains of their dead were systematically gathered up from battlegrounds, reservation cemeteries, as well as archaeological sites and shipped to the newly founded Army Medical Museum, which became a kind of processing grounds for human remains that, that, that were then sent out to various museums across the United States. These 
U.S. Army hospitals really became laboratories for processing indigenous human remains. The famed anthropologist Franz Boas also participated in this process of collecting Native American human remains. During the late 1880s, Boas was employed by the British Association for the Adv Advancement of Science, where he conducted a general survey of tribes in British Columbia. His goal was to collect linguistic as well as physiological anthropological data. He was also supposed to collect Native American skulls and skeletal parts. To acquire these human remains, Boaz used a photographer to distract indigenous people while he sec secretly removed remains from graves. During his trip to British Columbia, he collected about a dozen or so human remains and, and uh, cranial remains in particular. Boaz's remains collecting came to a halt when local Cowichan indigenous people discovered that their graves had been desecrated and actually obtained a warrant to search Boaz's collections. In response, in the middle of the night, Boaz shipped all of these illicit materials, nearly 200 crania, to New York under falsified invoices. In 1889, all of these human remains were purchased by Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. The university is displayed here behind me. These human remains that have been purchased, acquired by Boaz and purchased by Clark were showcased in the 1893 World's Fair where Boaz created a, syst a systematic arrangement of Northwest Coast skulls and associated material culture. More popular, however, than these skeletal remains was the exhibit Boaz organized at the fair with a dozen Kwakiutl people who built a traditional longhouse in the fair's ethnological zoo. This ethnological zoo placed various different indigenous groups like Apaches, Diné, and Iroquois families alongside each other in order that viewers could compare living cultural types. Boaz's collecting ventures demonstrate the intimate relationship between colonization in the United States, the collecting of indigenous human remains, and the development of anthropological museum collections and exhibitions. During the early 20th century, most research in bioarchaeology and biological anthropology was carried out in museums like the Harvard Peabody, the Smithsonian, and the Museum of Natural History. Beginning in the 1920s, however, physical anthropology as an academic discipline started to expand, primarily under the direction of Ernest Houghton at Harvard University. By the 1950s, physical anthropology and biological archeology span have moved away from these kind of descriptive measurements of craniology and descriptive measurements of society like social Darwinists, and instead had started doing hypothesis testing. Sherwin Washburn, a student of Hooten's, led this new way, wave of kind of scientific scholarship. Washburn's work focused on primate and human evolution and looked at human variation based on population size rather than racial groups. Despite Washburn's arguments for a shift towards population rather than race, the concept of race remained a concrete unit of analysis in the minds of many scientists into the 20th century. For example, three of Ernest Houghton's students, Carlton Kuhn, Stanley Garn, and Joseph Birdsell, developed a six-fold geographical classification that divided the major racial groups across the world into 30 subpopulations, and then identified micro and hybrid populations within these different groups. <clears throat> 
This group of scholars incorporated concepts of adaptation drawn from Darwin to environment and natural selection in order to explain these variations across the 30 subpopulations. Their work was different from previous efforts because they applied evolutionary, genetic, and ecological principles to identify these racial or population variations. Although the problematic collecting practices of the 19th and 20th centuries have since ended, archeologists are still dealing with the consequences of these skull collecting endeavors. To learn more about some of the recent controversies around human remains, check out this article from NPR about the University of Pennsylvania, which has held the Morton's Cranial Collection for the past 150 years. <laughs>